And it's an a skeptical emoji. A skeptical emoji, my friends. Let's go back with Matea. Matea, how do you feel about getting an a skeptical emoji reaction from me? Honestly, as soon as I saw the five, I went, hopefully it's the skeptical one because I want people to think. I want people to see what I post or what I talk about, and I want them to think about it. So I am honored to have that skeptical emoji. Love it. Okay. So you're honored. Now let's let's talk about a little bit about the, the yeast of the work that you do. So when you talk about the United Nations, could you expand a little bit or elaborate um, Even what are the United Nations when I, I mean, just the phrase itself, like United Nations sounds like a good thing to me. So can you expand a little bit of, on what the United Nations are and how do people get to participate in the work that United Nations does? Absolutely. So it's it is a global institution. Uh, and they do a lot of work in every country. There's 193 what we call member states. So that's like Canada, United, uh, United States, different European countries. They all send delegations, groups of people, to the United Nations bodies, both in New York, New York City, and in Geneva. And there, those different governing um Uh, delegations come to advocate on behalf of their country's best interests uh, at a global table, essentially. And what the United Nations does is they do a lot of advocacy, but they also do a lot of work regarding, primarily in my realm, it's regarding children's education, family stability, food security, and economics. Like the, the list just goes on and on and on. Basically, any part of life they deal in and so they have different groups different branches like the like everybody has heard about the who the world health organization a lot of people have heard of unicef our united uh, un women um undp like there's just so many branches of the un and so it's a place originally it was a, it was meant to be a place where different governments whether hostile or friendly could come to the same table and talk about issues global issues. And so it was also meant at the, the founding of the UN was meant to prevent a, another world war. So it was founded right after the second world war. And a lot of people are engaged with the UN primarily through donations. But another way that people can get involved, not necessarily everybody can get involved on the level that I'm at, because I actually go into the UN, let's sit in on their meetings uh, at different UN commissions. So it's like a huge conference and Uh, the way you get into my role is I came from a political background. I worked in, in government in Canada on various levels and ended up meeting different people, like you always do, regardless of the sphere of influence that you're in. And that's how I got into this role of, of going in and hearing what they're saying and then advocating for on behalf of, of the various issues that I brought up previous. So a lot of people can get engaged online. A lot of people can read Uh, what the United Nations is publishing on their website or what different advocates like myself talk about. And, and you can listen. I mean, they have UN TV. There's so many different ways that you can, you can hear what they're saying and read what they're doing. Um, but to get engaged on the, on my level, you have to go into uh, one. You have to know, I don't know everything there is to know about the UN. It's just like government. It's huge. And there is a never ending, uh, list of publications and resources and different people you need to know but to get into this position you have to under have a general understanding of how governance works and also you have to understand that behind every initiative is an agenda essentially so that's how you get into a role like mine and uh yeah i hope that answers your question yes it does um i just so 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 interesting um And of course, I mean, you're way more, more involved. Like you said, you have a, a, a background in politics in a sense, and that's how you got in. So I guess you have a way more understanding of you know, things behind agendas and things like that. Um, but I'm going to tell you kind of like why, why my reaction was skeptical. And it's because when I think, you know, let's just say in the last, the last couple of years, 
right? That we've experienced COVID, like on a on a global level. Uh, there's a lot of discomfort globally, also, and ideologies and whatnot. And just no, talking to friends and whatnot, I I understood that there's this thing called conspiracy theories, right? And I'm I'm a futuristic person. And sometimes when I when I see through the lens of what's going on globally and whatnot, and I'm a I know this is the Christian podcast, so I'm also a believer. Uh, but then sometimes when I think of truth versus conspiracy, you know, I was just telling my friend, man, you know, I feel like sometimes it it feels like there's somebody pulling the strings on like this mm -hmm. higher level, you no, know, whether it be government or just you no know, people in power. You now call it social media giants or whatever, right? Like just these people that are in power that have influence over so many people. And sometimes it does seem like they pull levers and things move and things happen and, you know, ideologies uh, get forced into other people and whatnot. And my friend was telling me, man, that is like the mother of all conspiracy theories, Right? Mm -hmm. That there is a there is a, a government or somebody up there that kind of controls everybody else, and that's where I feel like, man, how how do we even find truth among like this th these levels of power that a person like me is just like so unaware of, you know? So when mm -hmm. I see that you are in that background, in that realm, involved with United Nations, I'm like, okay, maybe maybe Matea knows something that I don't know. In this term, so when it comes to to conspiracy versus truth, what are you experiencing in those levels of influence that cause you to to want to make people to think? Um, so, what is the difference? I guess, yeah, in your realm, what is the difference between truth and conspiracy? Well, be, I love I love this. We didn't I didn't know the topic of what we were going to discuss today. But as soon as you said conspiracy, it's like, yes, right on. I, you know, what? I know a lot of the conspiracies because people send me stuff all the time uh, from from all around the world. Like, did you hear this? Did you hear this? So and so is doing this. And so I'm aware of a lot of conspiracies and something that I people are going to flip when I say this. I actually really appreciate some conspiracies. I'll just leave it at that. I won't say which ones, but because they make people think outside of the box, a lot of people are just fed information and essentially told what to think. Like our kids in schools nowadays, they're basically told what to think and not how to think. And so I, I appreciate that about conspiracy, but also it speaks to a deeper part of being human. We seek truth. Like we want to know the truth because then we can put it to action. We can put action behind it. And so in, in my realm, a lot of, you know, conspiracy theories or theorists, they're often, they're often people or ideas that have an element of truth to them. Right. So a lot of people uh, talk about Bill Gates, for example, or George Soros, like various names that always pop up. And I'm like, yeah, George Soros, Bill Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, like so many different organizations, Planned Parenthood, all so many philanthropists give so much money to the United Nations. And then that causes the U.N. to take specific action on different on different elements or different issues, uh, different initiatives. And so I go, yeah, like Bill Gates is his grandfather was intimately tied to Planned Parenthood and actually got Planned Parenthood to be an advocate, an essential role now at the United Nations. And they have a ton of leverage. Like they help create one of the most sexualizing curriculums for our children worldwide. That was Planned Parenthood and the UN linking arms. And that was the production of, of what they produce. So I see a lot of things that come my way and I go, yeah, like, yeah. So like Bill and Melinda Gates, George Soros, whoever else is funding a lot of these different initiatives. Of course they are. Like it's just fact for me. Um, but a lot of people see them as conspiracy because it's new information to them. Right. But if there, if there's a paper trail of something, I go, you know what? Like, look at, look how much France 
gave in in donation or funding to whatever UN branch, whether it's UNFPA, UN uh, UN Women, whatever it may be, and it's because they're a very so-called feminist government. But it, it just makes sense if you if you believe in something like the French government believes in radical feminism, you're going to donate your money or fund something that is of the same ideology or worldview. So for me, a lot of the conspiracies um, aren't necessarily conspiracies. There are legitimately some conspiracies out there, but a lot of them are just, Hey, like, yeah, here's a paper trail. Like go look at the funding. It's not as exciting as you might think it is. Um, or as conspiracy theorists may, you know, they may, a lot, a lot of the conspiracies I get said have like this doomsday, uh, music behind it. And it's all very dark. And a lot of the things that, a lot of the things that are being funded, yes, are very dark. Mm. And that's, that's kind of the realm in which I'm dealing in. But for me, a lot of them are just facts. And I just, yeah, like it's a shrug off my shoulders or, or I just say, there's no fact to it. And I just go, eh, it's another one. And you move on because there's going to, there's always going to be a conspiracy out there. Wow. So, oh, that's, that's just incredible. When, I mean, one of my questions that just comes out of um, this conversation would be like immediately is like, why would people try to push on with these agendas like what is the if you could tell what is the driving force behind you know like like you were saying a uh, sexual sexualized society or feminism um what is the driving force like are we are we trying to evolve as humans what do you see in your from your understanding that is pushing these agendas what is like the mentality behind it like we want to be better humans who are tolerant or like what, mm -mm. what do you see? No, I see it as actually, I, I would say I even know partially anyway, because I can't speak to the intent of an individual, but I can speak to an ideology. So when I look at the ideologies behind various issues that are arising all of a sudden in society and then governments react and then form legislation on them. I immediately go, Oh, there's an intent behind all of this ideology, not necessarily the individuals pushing them because a lot of people in government or at the UN, um, I would say more so in government though, aren't necessarily pushing certain ideologies intentionally. It's more so when you're in government, and you understand politicians, it's mainly to, uh, if you're re creating reactionary policy or state creating a statement reactionarily to something happening in society, it's because you want to gain votes or gain favor with the people mm. at, at a moment where they're reacting. And so you, you form some common ground with them. Right. So when, when we look at <laughs> everything happening, um, it, it's very interesting because, with these various issues like feminism, like the pro-abortion movement, like easy divorce or legalization of prostitution, I can easily point to, let's say, a UN special rapporteur and say they're pushed, they, the special rapporteur on freedom of religion or access to education or whatever, health even. Um, these individuals have a, a background which is all very similar, if not the same. And so then you go, okay, I can connect the dots then. If you're a very communistic thinking individual working at the UN, well, I, it's just going to be like normal for me to go, okay, well, it makes sense that you're, you're pushing abortion or you're pushing divorce or prostitution. And so the ideology of a communistic society, uh, it, it, it's just something that I've come to realize as something that they want, because if you can push feminism in every single country and have groups on the ground that you fund, like the United Nations does, or even a pro-abortion group like Planned Parenthood or Marie Stokes International, the UN will fund those groups on the ground in various countries that are quite conservative labeled or traditional so that they can make sure that that society starts to shift their mentality towards being more pro-abortion or more pro-feminist, right? 
so that every society in the world starts to think the same and have the same values, same beliefs. And what does the what does the United Nations want? They want a one world government. Now, as soon as I say that one world government, everybody's going to go, ah, like that's that's conspiracy right there. It's not. It, it's literally you just go into the UN and you look it up. It's right there. And they work with it, various partners like the World Economic Forum or the International Monetary Fund and several, several others who do have a lot of power behind them. But again, I can't speak to the intent, but it is to get everybody every nation on the same trajectory, right? Same belief system, same economic policy, uh, same ecological policies, so that everybody can then simultaneously jump on board onto a one world governing system. And that's in a very long, broad uh, explanation of it all. That's, That's my answer to your question. Wow. Yeah, so that makes sense, and there's so many ways I could go. Um, this is Christian podcast, so even theologically, I could start going to, uh, you know, and I don't want to scare people because I, I want to give a lot of grace and room in this podcast to people who are skeptical. But um, I also think about, you know, the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse and it kind of mentions these uh, these like broad ideas of you know the the mark of the beast that maybe sounds scary or you know it sounds mm-hmm. just like weird or imagery that doesn't make sense, but in a sense if you see it through the lens of like without the mark of the beast nobody can buy or sell just that fact mm-hmm. right there you know so if you apply that to one world order that says you know either and I'm I'm futuristic so again. If at some point they say a cryptocurrency is the only currency we have and it's one mm-hmm. currency and it's global. And right now, you know, Bitcoin is actually a, a global currency that people can utilize and make transactions globally with no interference of governance and whatnot. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I see it through that lens, then I, I start thinking, man, just the, the Bible makes a lot of sense in, in when it portrays these visions of the future. Right. But at the same time, well, you're going to say something. So I want to hear that. Yeah, no, I I actually, as soon as you brought that up, I was like, yes, cashless society. Let's talk about it. I just wanted to quickly bring up there's actually um, the Federal Reserve. Right. They just released and I'm reading it off of my phone because I kept it. They just released uh, a 40 page study on the digital dollar and it states initial analysis suggests that a potential us cbdc would best serve the needs of the us by being privacy protected and so on and so on and so on and so they're actually the federal reserve is actually advocating for a cashless society like it's it's a it's amazing to me um but yeah i just wanted to throw that in there for for anybody listening because the world is moving very quickly in that direction Wow, cashless society. So you were mentioning several agendas, I would say, that um, are kind of like behind this. Well, you you called it like communistic, right? Vision mm-hmm. of the world. So you're mentioning like you know, sexualized society. You're mentioning uh, pro-abortion. You're mentioning cashless society. And in a sense, let's just be, let's just give like the the benefit of the doubt to everyone let's just play almost like devil's advocate and say what's so bad about it you know if if this will make us more tolerant or understand people and have freedom of choice uh people can have their own choice it's their own body um like do you see people saying what's so wrong about this it's actually better for humanity and what would your reaction be I I actually very rarely, actually almost ever get that sort of reaction, which is interesting to me because when people actually hear a breakdown of what's actually happening behind different issues, like the pro-abortion movement, for example, they start to understand, oh, it's it's not really about my body, my choice. It's about... (laughs) <laughs> so for me, when I went to this, again, population control, a lot of people immediately, again, freak out. But it's it's true. It, it, the pro-abortion movement is not just about liberating women or giving free choice. It's about corrupting 
human nature, which is to protect the vulnerable, defend the vulnerable. And when we look from even a Christian perspective, we're even called as believers, I'm a Christian and I'm called by my God to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Well, that clearly defines the child in the womb. And I'm also to hold back those staggering towards slaughter. Well, a child is completely slaughtered, obliterated in the womb when an abortion occurs. And so I'm, and I'm also called to love and be generous. So to any mother or family who's considering an abortion, I'm also called to help them and to walk with them and to be gracious and loving towards them. So all these various movements, like the feminist movement, it is anti-God because it is anti-family. of time he instituted the family for himself and for one another and so when you look at these various agendas they're all very anti-god and that that's something that we have to come to a realization of um and as we get farther and farther into time you said you're a very futuristic guy and revelation if there was ever a book about the future um it, it's revelation and it's everything it's talking about is coming true. So that, that for me is, is what I'll, what I'll leave it at for now. Wow. Wow. That's so good, Matea. So I feel like you're a little bit of like, you know, if I know we're talking about Bible and, and this is a Christian podcast again. So <laughs> uh, Shocker. I, I feel okay to talk about, you know, stories in the Bible. And when I think of even John the Baptist, It strikes me as a character who's got a very specific wiring that even in his interactions with Jesus, I'm like, wow, Jesus is, it's almost like a complete different person than John the Baptizer is because John the Baptizer, it's a little more uh, in your face in his messaging, mm -hmm. you know, even to the point that he goes to you know, the governor and say, hey, you're doing this, this, this and that, and that's wrong. And then I encountered Jesus uh, where people bring, for example, you know, a woman caught in adultery and they bring her to him. And I find Jesus even like almost like more gracious than you know, maybe John the baptizer. But at the same time, it's almost like Jesus validates his cousin, John the baptizer all the time, you know. And John the baptizer ended up beheaded because of his wiring and because of his calling out of these people in government. And, you know, I mean, I'm not saying you're going to be beheaded, but in a sense, maybe <laughs> words, maybe be, maybe words behead you all the time because of the type of work that you're doing in, in like, almost like calling out this, this wrongs that you see in the government. So tell me a little bit about the, I don't know if you perceive them as attacks, but How do you perceive like the, the people when you're calling out people, what are the reactions of people like uh, specifically to you? How does that make you feel? Well, at first, when I first started in all this, it kind of shocked me how rude people could be, but you know what? I'll tell this one story. There was a woman on Instagram uh, about a year or two ago. And I had posted about Hillary Clinton and her pro abortion views and, and, I don't necessarily post like attacking individuals. It's more so attacking what they're doing. Uh, but this one woman reached out and she was very negative in her comment back to me. And that was, it was attacking me as a human being, as a person. And so I actually decided there's something about her. And I went, I'm going to just DM her. And so, because she was very hoorah for abortion and come to find out, we ended up having this great exchange in our DMs and she just went, oh my gosh, I had an abortion. I realize I'm still hurting from it. She used to be on Hillary, camp Hillary Clinton's campaign years ago and has been a Hillary addict essentially ever since then. And she went, nobody's ever talked to me like you have. Like so gracious and so understanding of my pain. No one's talked to me about the pain of abortion and you validated that that pain is there. And so after that experience, I went, oh my gosh, like the people who attack or who have really negative reactions or say, I want to blow off your head or whatever else it might be. Because there's been those people 
I go, there's a very real reason why people react the way they react. And so instead of my responding to them with the same level of negativity or condemnation, I actually have a lot of sympathy and, and actually compassion for these people because there's real hurt there and it's just being expressed towards me. And I'd much rather somebody express it towards me because I know I'm going to be compassionate and sympathetic towards them as opposed to someone else. Right. So I I don't see them as attacks anymore necessarily. I see them more as opportunities to engage and hopefully put someone on the trajectory towards healing. Wow. That's what a great heart. So I commend you for that. And, uh, Yeah, I mean, what what out of work? I mean, I, I I could only imagine the tension of being in the work in the type of work that you do because it's almost like confronting people with their reality, but at the same time, uh, like you're saying, you know, to do it with a lens of grace and and trying to put yourself almost like in 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 the other people's shoes and but at the same at the same time, that's why I'm saying you know John the Baptizer, like almost like calling out this reality that might be painful even as you call it out and people mm -hmm. will react differently. So, wow. I mean, that says a lot about you know, who you are and the type of work that you do. So let's go to, you know, let's let's just talk about COVID for a little bit because I know that's... Yay! Yeah. Everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of, I guess we can start here. Let's start with hope. Do you see anything hopeful about our future as in regards to COVID? Are we getting to the end of it? Um, and just in general, from from your perspective, are we are we in a better situation now? Whatever that means. Are Whatever we better than means. we were? <laughs> yes. I, I know I'm a better person. I know my family's better. I I've seen a lot of family re reunification. Over COVID, there's also been, I, I will not deny, there's been a lot of hurt that has occurred over COVID for families as well. Um, but a lot of people have gained a voice. They are not gained a voice. Everybody has a voice, but they, they realize that their voice actually matters and that an advocate, like people are engaged now. People are so engaged now. People are, are staying up to date with what the government's saying and they're actually calling out They're calling the government out or they're calling advocates out or whoever else out for hypocrisy or for wrongdoing. And so people, I think, are much more aware. So I think that's a good thing because people have been so lulled to sleep, believing that the government or whoever else is really for them. Or I'm not saying that people in government aren't for people. I'm saying government as a body um, hasn't really been functioning as it should. And so people are aware of that now. And so going forward, I think people will be, be very much more independent and seek truth. So I think that's a very good thing. And with regards to the timeline of COVID, who the heck knows anymore? Honestly, I am just of the opinion <laughs> that Every, there's always there's so many variants and I'm like, you know what you guys like you throw every variant out there. I personally don't care what variant you throw out there or what name you give it. I know that it, it's all it, it's a play almost. It's a show. And so the show is almost over, I believe. but I would be amiss to believe that governments or different institutions like the UN or whoever else at a philanthropist like Bill Gates, that they don't want something else to reoccur or to occur after this post COVID era as they're labeling it. Uh, I, I know, I know a lot of things like uh, Bill Gates talking about a smallpox epidemic or whatever else breaking or emerging in societies. And I'm like, you know what? People are going to either throw that away or they're going to take it as truth. Uh, and I'm just, whatever comes, comes now. I've always been, I've always been a very kind of whatever comes, comes kind of person. But honestly, if we adopt that mentality and we're, but we're always ready in every season, which is a biblical principle, if we're always ready, if we're always topped up, if we're always praying and we're ready to take action and engaged in our communities, then we're all going to be okay. Like we're going to be more than okay, but it, we have to take to heart 
being salt and light in the world. We have to take that to heart and being ready in every season because people are hurting right now, but we carry a message of hope that this life, this is not our only life. We have life in Jesus, right? And we, we have to be willing to, to express that hope because we believe that this life is setting us up for the life to come. Right. So I, I am very hopeful. I'm a very optimistic person. If you know me, if you know, my family will tell you, my friends will tell you, I'm a very optimistic person. And, uh, I see great hope for our societies and great hope for our families, our friends and ourselves. Wow. I love, I love hope. And it's the only tool that helps me in my futuristic thinking. because the negative of my futuristic thinking is, thinking the worst is going to happen in the future. And I need to intentionally add hope. And in this case, specifically like the hope of, of God, the hope of Jesus, the hope of, of his kingdom into my visions of the future. Otherwise, you know, it's just, it's just dystopia that I picture, you know? So yeah, I, well, you, and if, I, if I can say about yes. that really quick, you know, I was just reading and in the new Testament where, Jesus is clearly laying out, if you follow me, you're going to face persecution. You will face in the end days, many, many things. And he gives a list of them. And I just went, oh my gosh, yeah, no kidding. We're facing all this. But he says, I have overcome the world. And the same spirit that dwells in me dwells in you. And he's given us Holy Spirit. And so we don't have to be afraid of what the future comes. I think we need to be even more so bold in this time speaking truth, extending hope, being light and love and life in our communities, because we know what's coming. We know. So, so why worry about it? If, if the one who resides within us already overcame the spirit of the age, why do we need to fear? We serve the God who's above the God of this world. So, and we're not of this world. We're just in it, right? We're of the kingdom. So we need to bring the kingdom into every sphere of our influence. Wow. That's so good. So uh, just one last story before we go to our blasphemous to divine. But um, as I'm thinking, you know, I, I was talking with my pastor here in Costa Mesa, California, and I was reading a few of your Instagram posts that you do on your page. And I think you have two pages. Um, but anyways, I was reading one of them where it's, it's kind of like your, your activism. It's kind of like showcased in the Instagram account. And as I'm reading some of what you're saying, you know, I can hear my pastor in the background uh, in his office kind of saying, yay, amen, don't be afraid, you know, preach it, kind of like that type of thing. Right on. And uh, it, I mean, to me, I, I tend to be a little, I'm more like always on the uh, skeptical ground, but at the same time, I'm like, um, there's an element of trust, right? But at the same time, where I feel like I totally agree with, I can come to like, yes, there's something wrong, even with the COVID, with what's happened with the global agenda, whatever you, you want to name it. Uh, the part that makes sense to me is, are we living out of fear versus out of the abundance that life can offer? And in my case, you know, the life that Jesus wants to offer us So regardless, you know, of what's thrown out there, if it's COVID, maybe let's say COVID is not a creation of any government or whatever, and there's whatever other disease, are we going to live lives that are just afraid to even live life, to, to get out, to say, no, man, I, I don't want to, I don't want to die. Like we're so afraid of this virus and maybe with, with a healthy, a healthy dose of, of reason, because I do have friends who who had COVID and ended up in the hospital and like almost died, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. dang, like how do I balance? Like there's a reality. I had COVID and the worst that happened to me is I lost my taste and smell and then it came back. But, yeah, same here, right? same here. So, it was brutal, but yeah. So it's, it's just so weird, like, but the tension of now I'm going to live a, a fearful life because mm -hmm. I almost died or my friend died or something like that. It's like, ah, oh, life is not supposed supposed to be like that yeah maybe let's be a little careful but i don't know that and that's the tension when it comes to you know like you gotta wear a mask and this and that and <laughs> i don't know there's a lot of that uh but tell me i guess let's end on on uh 
fear versus what's what's the opposite of fear from your Faith. vantage point okay it's so Faith. tell me about that Absolutely. how how can people experience that in this season of maybe uncertainty yeah, yeah. honestly <sighs> So I talk with my friends all the time and I always come away from those conversations most of the time. Anyway, I won't say all the time, most of the time coming away, feeling extremely like uplifted and you know, you have like a different perspective when you're talking to other people. Right. And what's interesting in this, in this kind of um, analogy is relationship with Jesus because that relationship, you come away every time you're walking and talking with Jesus, you come away with a different perspective on life, different perspective on the situation you're in, what you're personally going through at work, at play, uh, in your finances, in your health, everything, everything changes and for the better. And so I would say having that intimacy with Jesus on a personal relational um stand that that's going to shift everything for you. And I also would be, <laughs> I would be amiss not to say, stop listening to the news, stop reading headlines and taking them as truths. When you look at who, like so much, especially in Canada and the U S in the U S so many of the exact same corporations own various media outlets, but they're all pushing the same message in Canada. Basically, everybody is government funded with regards to the media. So stop listening to the media. Stop listening to the news. Um, seek out individuals who work in specific spheres and find your information from them. Um, it, it's interesting because, you know, you brought up the element of fear and faith and being cons almost people are so consumed by fear right now. But a lot of people are also very, very hopeful for the future. So there is a very stark divide in society. But what did Jesus do? This is what I love to bring up because Jesus came that we would have life, but not just life, abundant life, life to the full. And it was for freedom that he came to set the captives free. Fear is a chain. It binds our hearts, our minds, even down to how we act or react. And Jesus didn't come so that you could be bound in chains. He came to set you free and to open your eyes, right? So intimate personal relationship with Jesus and be very careful at what you consume in this day and age. Wow, that's so good. Intimate relationship with Jesus. Okay, so Matea, this is what we're going to do right now. We're back to the emojis. <laughs> back to the emojis. It's great. Yeah, you're going to love this. So there's five emojis on my screen that you get to see. And your job is going to be to tell me from blasphemous to divine. Uh, what are the most? So we're going to go. What are the most blasphemous ideas in the type of work that you do that you can think of? Or maybe just one, right? We're going to go with one on each. So if oh, I say goodness. Matea Merta, what is the most blasphemous idea out there in the type of work that you do? What would be your answer? Oh gosh, uh, blasphemous would be pro-abortion Christian who labels themselves as a communist. There you go. Wow, that's deep right there. That's deep. Okay, we're gonna move on to skeptical. Either what makes you, what are you skeptical of, or where do you see skepticism played out in the type of work that you do? Mm. I'm skeptical of everything, literally everything. Anything I see, I'm skeptical of it and I question it. So uh, I would say anything coming out, any kind of proposed legislation coming out of government, I'm always skeptical. Wow. <laughs> That was so good. Okay. Uh, Inspired emoji. What inspires you or where do you see inspiration in this type of work? What inspires me is the beauty of family and the power of families in every nation. But also what inspires me too is the youth of today because they're passionate and they're go-getters. Wow, that was, that was beautiful. Okay. And I do this at the end of the show. I wish I could elaborate more, but it's the end of the show. So let's move on to holy. 
where do you see something holy or holiness in the type of work you do? Hmm. In the work I do, being led by the Holy Spirit. Because you have to see past, you have to understand there's an agenda behind everything. And he leads and he guides in a way that people question as to how do you know what you know? It's only because of the Holy Spirit. Wow. All right. And lastly, divine. Where do you see something divine in the type of work that you do? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> the redemption, the redemption stories that come out of people hearing what I'm talking about and either their hearts, you know what, their hearts changing towards believing in Jesus or or coming to a realization that there is something good worth living for. So that that would be divine. Wow. All right, my friends, there you have it. What an amazing conversation. If this was not, you know, sparking questions in your brain, I don't know what will, uh, but that's the purpose of Skeptical. And this was Matea Merta doing her work, her activism from Canada to the world in the United Nations and whatnot. Um, If you want to follow Matea, Matea, where can people find more about the type of work that you do uh, if they want to follow your Instagram posts and you know, get informed by what you are witnessing? Absolutely. Well, everything is pretty simple. Every platform, primarily Twitter and Instagram are where I'm at, but also Facebook and Getter and Gab and all the others. You can find me at Matea Murda. Matea Murda. Okay. Awesome. So Matea Murda. It's on Instagram, it's on Facebook, everywhere. Go and check it out. Also, if you want to learn more about Christian Podcasts, go visit christianpodcast.com. I have merch, I have emojis, I have fun <laughs> with this podcast. But at the same time, I think we're together discovering truth and welcoming one another to the conversation. So, Matea, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. God bless. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.